Okay. Right, hello, uh, TEDx Flanders. So I'm coming from the Netherlands, and I'm going to tell you some things about life up there, which may amuse you. But you should also wonder if such things could happen here as well, here in Belgium, in Flanders. Okay, uh, so actually my talk is not about big data very much. There's going to be some data in there, there's going to be some statistics, there's going to be some probabilities. There might even be a formula. No, not really a formula, but there will be a concept from statistics. But don't worry, we just saw a beautiful lady dancing, and then in a moment some guy's going to talk about androids and drones and stuff, so you'll survive, as other people almost didn't. Okay, uh, I put some little uh, sayings here at the bottom. Uh, uh, I, I believe this is a, a, well, it's actually a quote from, um, what's his name, Mark Twain, but it seems to be also a quote of one of the sponsors, uh, famous Flemish person, Jeff, I've forgotten his surname. Um, but he said, when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. That's certainly very convenient, but it's, this is not a very good saying, really, because remember that when you, when you only tell part of the truth, that might actually be telling a big lie by what you've omitted, which you probably didn't know. And actually, that's an important theme in statistics. You can start off with some big data, and then you can go into it and find a little piece and then tell somebody about it, and you can tell them what you saw there. If you don't tell them why you went after it, and how you went after it, and how you found it, the story is not complete. The little piece of data, the number or whatever, is not the only thing. I hope that will, uh, may or may not become clear, but I mean, you have to remember the messenger is also part of the message. It's not just what's written in the envelope, but it's how it came to you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Lucia de B case, and I actually didn't really want to, because it's something I have been doing for the last few years, and moving on to Many other things nowadays, such as, we'll have a look. oh yeah, there's the clock. Uh, like nowadays, I've been working on uh, forensic uh, identification of criminals through mobile phone records, metadata from mobile phones, correlating people's movements to, uh, uh, well, phones which are connected to a crime, to places where people frequent, so you can see who the guy was who was carrying that phone around. But, okay, that's something else. I'm not going to talk about that today. Many other things I can't talk about. Have to get a move on. Yes. Now, this uh, film... So, there's a film coming out in the Netherlands in, on 3rd of April. That's next week. Actually, I'm going to, go in, I'm going to be at the uh, premiere on uh, Sunday. And actually, I hope to meet Lucia there. This, obviously, is not Lucia the Bee, the nurse, who I will tell you all about, but an actress. And this uh, movie is, uh, is based... Uh, basically on her experiences. So this is Lucia de B, Lucia de Berg, as we now know her. Uh, and uh, um, she finally was exonerated of terrible crimes after a long process lasting about 10 years in 2010. And in 2011, a book came out by her. And if you're Dutch or Flemish and read Dutch, you should bloody well read this book. It's absolutely gripping and it's fantastic, and it's about what it's like to be being interrogated, and so on and so on. And it, uh, ends, it starts in 2001 when she's arrested, and it ends in 2006, which is when another book came out, and 2006 was when she got to hear that the Supreme Court had refused any further consideration of her case, so in 2006 she knew she was sentenced for life. In the Netherlands that means for life. And actually, she uh, suffered a stroke then and um, lay on her cell floor unconscious for half a day, I believe, even though she was a very high-profile prisoner and guards were supposed to be checking on her every hour. And uh, afterwards, even the physiotherapy and proper uh, uh, medical care was withheld from her. So that was actually, I would say, an attempt by the Dutch state to murder this evil person. Now, in 2006, a book came out by a guy called Tom Derrickson who uh, reconstructed the case, and this was kind of the start of a movement which took about six years or five years in order to get her a retrial. I was involved in this uh, second stage because when I read this book and I saw the arguments and the statistics on which this conviction was based, it didn't matter damn to me whether this woman was innocent or not, 
the point was you cannot send people to jail on the basis of circular, stupid, idiot arguments which are totally obviously flawed. It was totally clear the judges knew absolutely for sure that she'd done it, but there was absolutely no evidence for it, and they couldn't even write a straight story explaining it. It's a long story, so not many people actually read it. Uh, okay, so these are kind of heroes. A uh, bit on sharp picture, I'm sorry about this. Meta Deneau and Tom Dex, she's a medical doctor. He's a professor of philosophy, and they got involved. Uh, actually, they uh, have a family relationship to the uh, chef of the, uh, the chef de clinique at the hospital where this whole thing started. But they kept very quiet about that. They had some inside information which got them into this case, and he wrote a book. Well, together they researched, and he wrote a book, which I just showed you. And she also wrote a book. Oops, okay, we move on. Well, oh, we've moved back, okay, yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit chaotic person. I'm a mathematician, you know. So. I'll get back on my red spot. Yep. Okay. Okay. Now, this is important. This is the timeline. Uh, this is the, some basic facts and uh, numbers to have in mind. Sorry, there are going to be some numbers. Like, this is the beginning of the timeline. This is the, sort of the end of the timeline. Actually, as far as I'm concerned, and that's one of the messages I want to tell you, is I think that 2010, when her life conviction was revoked, uh, that, that's actually the start of part two. What actually happened? How could this have happened in a modern, civilized, enlightened country? How could this have happened? What happened? In 2001, uh, seven days before... Oh, sorry. Seven days... I want to sh just shine on the picture. Seven days before my 50th birthday, actually, I felt quite involved in that. But uh, seven uh, days before this event, 9-11, a, a, a baby died at a hospital. And initially it was thought, OK, this was a very sick baby with birth defects and stuff. This was not, not a surprise. But in the course of the day, a natural death was converted by some doctors into an unnatural death. And the police were alerted. And actually, the police weren't alerted about one death. They were alerted about... A, alerted about uh, sorry, alerted about, no, alerted of, sorry, alerted of about 10. So, well, a bit curious, and in no time, sorry, 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 I should not be using this red pointer, I'll put it down. In no time, uh, in the next couple of days, 30 plus possibly suspicious deaths were being investigated by the hospitals and by police at three or four hospitals in The Hague. And uh, processes that led to uh, arrest and uh, trials and lots of evidence. And finally, in, 2000, in 2003, Lucia got a life sentence for four murders and three attempted murders. And the evidence was basically statistical. The evidence was I'll show you the evidence in a moment a little table showing that she was often there when people died. They tended to die on her shifts. It's quite impressive evidence. But essentially, it was the only evidence. And what was especially powerful evidence was that the st oh, my goodness. a statistician did a calculation, and this number was in all the newspapers and in everybody's mind, one in 342 million, the chance that this could be a coincidence. That settled it for Lucia. I heard really hard-bitten journalists who, who till then had believed in her innocence and thought this was all nonsense, they turned over at this moment. Well, now, uh, okay, she appealed, actually the prosecution also appealed, and a year later at the higher court there was again a trial, and a, a, a quite a strange thing happened because now there is no statistical evidence, at least the judges say we do not use a statistical probability calculation, there's no statistics, and they say all the evidence is medical, and it's absolutely clear all these deaths were unnatural. Uh, it's absolutely clear that Lucia did it all, and so on and so forth. And she actually got uh, a life sentence and TBS, but I won't explain that for non-Dutch um, or Flemish-speaking persons, for seven murders and three attempts. Uh, actually, at this stage, there's actually, in some sense, less evidence various things have got thrown away, and they're not using statistics anymore, but suddenly all the evidence is medical. 
Uh, actually, I'll say it straight away, uh, there's a very clever trick for turning, for, when, a, when a, a lawyer says that some piece of evidence is medical evidence, he means it's written on a piece of paper which, with a signature of a policeman who took down the statement and a signature of a professor, doctor, medical specialist. And if the professor, doctor in medicine says an amateur statistical comment about he thinks things are unlikely, that's not statistical evidence. That's medical evidence. That was one of the cunning tricks. Uh, the statisticians had been very upset about all this, but the medical people were never upset about this. Okay, uh, and in 2006, the life sentence became definitive to the Supreme Court. But now, at this stage, what was the kind of the turning point of a fight, which was a, 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 a bit of a kind of a people power movement. Lots of people got involved, more and more people got involved after uh, Tom Derrickson's book came out, fighting to get the system to try to have another look at this. And it was very difficult because there was really no new evidence, there was just different ways of looking at the previous evidence. Okay, okay, please go on, yes. So what really happens, I mean, this is what I, I so I was thinking about sheep. I mean, so these are inquisitive sheep. They're all looking, asking themselves what happened. But actually, since 2010, the Dutch population is like a nation of sheep looking the other way and grazing. They're, nobody's asking what really happens. How could such strange things happen? I, you know, I forgot to say this bottom line here. 2010, there was a new trial, new court. The conviction was revoked. And that doesn't just mean to say there's no proof that she killed these babies and old people so we can't convict her. No, judges went out of the way to say all the deaths were natural. They actually said that. There were no murders. How could this possibly happen? This fascinates me, and also what amazes me is that hardly anybody, nobody I know, seems fascinated by this. I don't understand that at all. So what really happened? I have got an idea. Now here's some numbers. Uh, and I, okay, and let's just focus on this, these numbers here. These are the things which clinched it. Uh, these, this, okay, it's a bit difficult to understand at this stage of the evening, uh, afternoon, after such an exciting day. In a year at the hospital, there, were, uh, there are about a thousand shifts, because there are three shifts a day. Lucia has about one of, well, when she works, she has one of the three shifts. She works about half of the days. She has about one in six of the shifts during a year. In that year, there were nine incidents, a number of them were deaths. They all occurred in her shifts. That is almost impossible. Well, actually, it is impossible. I would say the data is fake. It, it is essentially impossible. And uh, this is what the data looks like after you go into it more deeply. Though, of course, there's no point in doing that, since later she was convicted on medical grounds, not on statistical grounds at all. Uh, uh, they hear the same things. I'm not going to stop on this here. Now, here, this is some p-values. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what p-values are. You should just realize that if ever you want to publish a scientific f finding in a journal, if the p-value is not smaller than 5%, then you can forget it. But as, as soon as it's the magic 5%, 1 in 20, which sort of means 1 in 20 chance, probability of chance, but actually that's not what it means. Uh, there's something very important here. Uh, let me start at the bottom. You all, probably all realize that a top baseball player, most top baseball players are pretty tall. The probability that a top baseball player is rather tall is very, very large. On the other hand, I imagine there are quite a few very tall guys here, but I don't imagine any of you are top baseball players. So the, prob whoops, the probability, oh, the probability, the probability that a tall guy is a top baseball player is actually quite small. And everybody mistakes these two things, and it's these two probabilities. And it's called the prosecutor's fallacy, and so on and so on. And basically, this probability, everybody interpreted this as being the probability she was innocent. Well, actually, it was supposed to be the probability that a guilty person, sorry, no, it was supposed, not supposed to be the probability she was innocent, it was supposed to be the probability that an innocent person would experience such extreme distribution of numbers of bad events in her shifts. The other way around, right? Well, actually, we later found out that the nut number should have maybe been 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 25. Well, let's, speak, let's do, look at this one here. This would mean that 1 in 1,000 Dutch nurses per year would experience such extreme events. 
well, there are quite a lot of Dutch nurses in the Netherlands. It's not so terrible. It's interesting, but it's because we've... Lucia was identified because of the coincidence, not the other way around. That's connected to what I told you a little while ago. Now, so the aftermath. Uh, justice, the Netherlands justice system has taken the blame for this whole um, enormous uh, mess, which took many years, a lot of money, shamed the Netherlands to the whole world, and, uh, of course, the taxpayers paid, uh, paid a heap of money. A lot of lessons have been learned, and this is uh, interesting. In the medical world, you do not read a word about this. You don't hear anything about this at all. Actually, I recently spoke to one of my students who has a friend who is a cursed assistant at the hospital where this all started, and he was discussing the case with his co assistant friend, who, you know, who wasn't there 10 years ago, and the, this young doctor-to-be, first of all, knew that Lucia was guilty and was not going to talk about it. They're, they're not allowed to talk about it, actually. Interesting. What really happened? Uh, I have got one minute and 50 seconds, and I can give you an idea of what I think might have happened. Uh, here's, an in, here's some more interesting numbers. Up till 2012 in the Netherlands, there were about 2,000 deaths per year in Dutch hospitals through avoidable, known medical errors. And that's four jumbo jets, right? That's four times the death rate on the roads. It's, the, I don't know, if you know, scale that to Belgium, it will be the same in Belgium. It's the same in the UK. It's the same in the US. It's, what it li it's like this all over the world. People make mistakes. People get killed in hospitals. Uh, a bad thing is that, in almost all cases, nobody ever admits to making any mistake. They're not even allowed to admit making mistakes. They cannot make mistakes. Their insurance company doesn't allow them to say they've made a mistake. Uh, the, uh, this is quite a scandalous situation, and even our Dutch Minister of Health is upset about this and has introduced some new measures, and apparently, since 2012, the number has halved. <laughs> That's quite incredible. Do you believe that some new rules would change that? Anyway, now here's some more evidence. We're running out of time We're very fast now. Um, those deaths were natural, yes. If you actually go into the, what we know now, we know now that those deaths were natural, but hastened by faulty diagnosis, faulty treatment, possibly known to those responsible, never brought to the attention of the courts. I suspect that all those medical specialists uh, told the truth in their uh, witness reports, but possibly not the whole truth. Uh, okay, this is my conclusion, this is my last slide. The last two seconds, I hope they don't put a little plug straight away. Look, when an airliner crashes, we investigate what happened and we take steps to prevent it ever happening again that way. You know, it happens a different way next time. The Lucia case was such a disaster, and nobody's investigated how it came about, and I think it can happen again tomorrow, possibly also in your wonderful country, too. Okay, that's it.